Okay, so let's start. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues and friends, uh, welcome to this round table on parabolic flight. My name is Vladimir Pletzer. I will be the moderator of this uh, uh, discussion, this round table, whose subject is aircraft parabolic flight campaigns for microgravity and student experiments. To recall parabolic flight are those type of flights, what should be seen on the next slide, there we go, those flights uh, that are made with aircraft flying through atmosphere. So we are not yet in space, we stay within the atmosphere. And uh, this uh, flight typically uh, follows this pattern that you see there on the screen in shape of a parabola is the uh, phase, the uh, zero G phase lasts a few seconds and it's usually preceded by uh, hypergravity phase and followed also by hypergravity phase. You see here the uh, profile for the Airbus A300 that is used was used until a few years ago. And you see also that the period, the duration of the zero G is only function of the initial velocity at injection, the V0, and also of the gravity field of the planet on which you do the public flight. So now we do that on Earth. Of course, maybe one day we do that on Mars, possibly not on the moon, but maybe on Mars. Uh, this is, next slide, there we go. This is a view of the A3, 100 still, uh, taken from uh, an outside plane, basically. And the uh, uh, plane that I use so far to do public flight are the KC-135 in, uh, from NASA a few years ago. Uh, actually, the Isaac Ness DLR Airbus A310, the Russian Ilyushin, these are the large planes that I use to do public flight and provide up to 20 seconds. And we have also small aircraft and glider that provide five to six, seven, eight seconds about. Also, parabolic flight are one of the platforms that are used to generate microgravity. You see here, we drop towers of typically four to nine seconds, sounding rocket, where there we have several minutes, and space station, where there we have typically several months or several years, and automatic satellites. So, parabolic flight is one of the payload, one of the platforms, sorry, on which we do uh, microgravity research. Uh, so it's used for uh, microgravity experiments, student experiments, but also astronaut training and general public discovery and awareness. So to debate about the usefulness of public flight, we have today with us a distinguished panel of experts and specialists in microgravity research and in parabolic flight. So thank you to all of you to have accepted uh, our invitation and to be here today. So let's start first with our first panelist, Dr. Marcus Brown. You are a biologist by trade. Uh, you conduct research on gravitropic signaling pathways and the role of cytoskeletal elements in gravity sensing cell types at the Australian National University of Canberra and at the Institute of Plant Molecular Biology of the University of Bonn in Germany here. You now head the German Space Life Science Program at DLR Space Administration, and you are Germany's delegate to the Human Spaceflight Microgravity and Exploration Program Board and the Exploration and Utilization Board of the European Space Agency. Marcus, welcome and thank you to be here. Tell us, if you please, in two sentences, why parabolic flights are important for you. Well, in my opinion, uh, parabolic flights are, um, are really beneficial for basically four, re uh, for, for reasons. It is, uh, very good. it is a very good platform for standalone experiments, which only need a few seconds of microgravity, and there are surprisingly big number of experiments you can do in these couple of seconds, 22 seconds, uh, as you heard already. It is a very nice platform to prepare for ISS experiments, uh, for example, or very expensive sounding rocket experiments or others. Uh, very nice platform to prepare for them. Uh, but also to involve students, to interest students, uh, young professionals, very important for all of us. And last but not least, involving everyone. We also like to fly uh, art artists, uh, musicians, and journalists, of course. This is really important for us because they experience a very special environment and they talk about it. And that's very important for all of us as well. Thank you. Our next uh, guest is Mr. Derek, or Duff, as he likes to be called himself. Uh, Mr. Derek Govanlock, you are a qualified uh, uh, flight test engineer within the Flight Operation Group at the Flight Research Laboratory in Canada. 
You graduated from the National Test Pilot School in the University of Tennessee with a master's degree in aerodynamics. You have more than 20 years of experience in test flight with the Royal Canadian Air Force. And since joining the Canadian National Research Council, you lead the Council, uh, Council's microgravity research activity, and you are currently the facility manager for the Falcon 20 microgravity research aircraft. Uh, Duff, we are very happy to have uh, uh, you with us today, and please tell us also shortly why parabolic fly are important uh, for you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, much like Marcus, um, I, I see the uh, parabolic flight is, is a, a component of the grand spectrum of uh, microgravity platform capabilities, and it, it uh, fits a niche uh, specifically as it applies to human interface with experiments, um, the, the ability to, uh, uh, to achieve uh, not only zero-G, but lunar and, and Martian gravity. And so fundamentally, when you look at all of the different capabilities as you had mapped out, uh, parabolic flight uh, fills an area where there's not a lot of additional overlap. And so fundamentally, it has its own benefit of being there for the PIs. And, uh, and certainly when you weigh in sort of the cost factors of everything else, it has its own value proposition. And so I see that it, it's just that fills the right niche. Okay, very well, thank you. Our next guest is uh, Dr. Jean-Baptiste Renard. And besides being a longtime friend, you are also a senior scientist at the Laboratoire de Physique et Chimie de l'Environnement et de l'Espace, where, in other words, Laboratory of Physics and Chemistry of the Environment and Space of the Centre National de Recherche Scientifique, so the National Centre of Scientific Research, the CNRS, in Orléans, in France. You work on the optical properties of solid aerosols and dust in the Earth's atmosphere and in the solar system. And since 1993, you participated in 60 parabolic flight campaigns with CNES and ESA, flying more than 4,200 parabolas to measure the scattering function of dust at different wavelengths, with several imaging a polar meter program to instrument. You involve also many students in your research and you had them flying with you. Jean-Baptiste, thank you for accepting our invitation also. Thanks. And please also tell us why are parabolic flight important for scientists? They are very important because scientists can be on board with their own experiment. That's the main point. We can change some parameters. If there is some problem, we can fly again and we can participate to a large number of campaigns. It is impossible in case of uh, space station or even rocket to have such a uh, large number of parabola to test something new, to change some parameters. So it is why it is very important for us to participate to a campaign, and uh, as you know, I am a frequent flyer. Thank you. Our next guest is Dr. Nigel Savage. You are a cell biologist and immunologists who conducted research in several universities in the United Kingdom, in the USA, and in the Netherlands. You joined ESA in 2011 to work on educational programs and payloads for the ISS, and since 2014, on gravity-related university student experiments. You coordinate all aspects of the ESA Academy programs that involve hands-on gravity-related research, that is, spin your thesis, drop your thesis, orbit your thesis, and the student public flight program, fly your thesis. Nigel, it's a pleasure also to have you with us today. So in your own short words, why, are import, why are public flight are important platform? Thanks, Vladimir, and thanks for having me. Um, it, it's a bit difficult to add already to, to what's being said, and Hans, uh, you're gonna have a, a tough time. Um, but I think from my perspective, uh, one, um, subject which hasn't been touched upon is the schedule. So when we provide um, parabolic flight opportunities for students, the schedule has to fit within their academic year if possible. And I think that uh, the scheduling for parabolic flights, the way we do it and fly your thesis, uh, suits certainly master students and, and definitely PhD students. The reproducibility as well, the, the 30 parabolas over three days, we can change parameters, as uh, has just been said. So um, for, for me, the, the two important factors are uh, the schedule that fits into an academic uh, year and the reproducibility and repeatability of the experiment. Thank you, Nigel. And finally, our last panelist is Dr. Hans Selig. You have degrees in physics and astrophysics from the University of Hamburg. You worked at the Drop Tower at Zand at the University of Bremen on payload tests for the microscope space mission and to improve microgravity quality of the Drop Tower. Uh, recently, in 2017, you moved to an aerospace company in Bremen, Gerhardt's uh, GmbH, as head of a new department, MyGrop, for microgravity operation, to develop new zero-G and partial G flight opportunities in the frame of an EU-funded project. 
And you are the initiator of this meeting today, so thank you for your work so far and welcome as well. And please tell us why are parabolic flight important and so. Okay, so as Nigel already said, I don't have anything to add, especially uh, to this topic, uh, but I, I would like to underline that it's really important to have a hands-on control to your experiment. And that, that's a big difference to like, let's say, drop towers or sounding rockets. And uh, at, in the end, it's, it's a first step into space. So that, that you have to keep in mind. And in, in the best way, all the different kinds of facilities can form a kind of stairway to heaven, if you would like to call it this, this way. And uh, parabolic flight is one of the most important po uh, parts or tools uh, in, that, in that direction, I think. Okay, thank you very much. And finally, my name is Vladimir Pletzer. I have several degrees in engineering and physics. I work for 30 years at the European Space Agency in charge of microgravity payload development and also the public flight program at ESA. I flew more than 7,360 parabola on 14 different planes, which is a world record. I was working as visiting professor, scientific advisor, uh, at the uh, Center for Space Utilization of the Chinese Academy of uh, Science in Beijing for two years, and I'm now director of a space training operation with Blue Abyss. It's a company, a startup company based in UK that proposed a new approach for astronaut training, including also parabolic flight. So I will try to moderate this roundtable today. We should debate around four questions that I will address to our panelists here, reminding them to stay short as well. We uh, should have in the background some videos on parabolic flight to support our discussion. You, the audience, would have uh, the opportunity to ask questions at the end. And uh, we will try to stay within the allocated time of one hour. So I apologize in advance if I have to cut you at some point, but uh, okay, that's my job as moderator. So let us start without any further uh, delay. And our first question is why parabolic flights are important to space agencies all over the world. Marcus, please be, give us the honor of being our first uh, panelist to answer this question. <laughs> it's nice to be the first one. <laughs> <laughs> well, for the European space agencies like uh, CNES, ESA, and especially also DLR, uh, parabolic flights became a, a working horse. We are working with a lot of platforms. Uh, we have uh, experiments on, on drop tower, on sounding rockets, on parabolic flights, on, on suborbital missions, on the ISS, and so on. But uh, I can only say that uh, the, the parabolic flight results were published in an unbelievable number and rate we had since uh, we started to do the first parabolic flight campaign that was in 99. It's uh, about 18, 19 years ago. Um, we have now flown, uh, flown 500, roughly 50 uh, experiments and published more than 800, almost 900 papers. Really good papers, actually, most of them, and this is an unbelievable number. Even for DFG, uh, this is a very high number, and the, the uh, success rate is, is really big. Um, one of the reasons is, of course, that it's easily accessible and it's affordable. Uh, even for the low budget, uh, which we sometimes have to deal with, uh, you all know that, we can afford a parabola, a parabola campaign, uh, one or two per year. And that means that we would have roughly maybe almost 30 experiments in one year. And we also need, of course, a good quality microgravity for that. If we have a good quality microgravity, if we have a large number of repetitions, uh, then we can do really good science. It is not only that we uh, put some handheld experiments in the plane, we have sometimes really very complicated experiment setups in the plane. And of course, we don't publish a paper after uh, one parable, uh, uh, parabolic flight campaign, uh, especially when you have a big device. But it gives us a chance to repeat the experiments, to come up with several campaigns, with several sets of data. And this is very important for science. On top of that, we can do human physiology studies on board the ISS. But of course, you know that this is uh, not very easy to put humans on the ISS, it's very expensive. Crew time is very limited. And on the parabolic flights plane, we have a chance to really do a lot of science, uh, human physiology science, in the microgravity condition, very extreme conditions. Sometimes it's also not only microgravity that we are interested in. It might also be higher gravity or lower gravity level uh, that we use. And that can almost all be done in a parabolic flight campaign. 
So for us, this is really a, a working horse, and we are happy about it to have that, and we will certainly continue to, do, to use them in the future. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Uh, Duff, maybe you want to give us a, a point of view on the other side of the uh, uh, Atlantic Ocean. What is going on in the North American continent? So it's, a, it's obviously a very similar application of, uh, of parabolic flight uh, to satisfy NASA's and uh, CSA's programs. Both, uh, both agencies uh, fund parabolic flight amongst all the other uh, methodologies to achieve uh, or facilities to achieve uh, microgravity. Um, and despite NASA having divesting of their aircraft, uh, the Flight Opportunities Program continues to, uh, continues to roll on and, and fund uh, research in microgravity, including uh, parabolic flight. In Canada, CSA uh, funds a variety of researchers uh, and research initiatives. We go from everywhere from uh, flying our astronauts, which was the, uh, the, the first picture there recently, the, the newest class of uh, Canadian astronauts. We were down in Houston flying, um, evaluating uh, uh, spacesuit technology uh, in this case, um, and then into sort of the, the fundamental physics, uh, as well as the applied technology building sort of that, that stairway to heaven, uh, to get, getting technology up to the ISS. and so. Be, be, the way the agencies work, they fund, uh, they fund the research, they don't fund the platform specifically. And so ultimately, uh, the, the work is done on, on the Falcon, for example, uh, because that's where the researchers want to go. And it, it affords the capabilities, exactly as Marcus said. Uh, and, and because we, f we fill that niche, uh, quality, time, cost, repeatability, um, it's, it's, uh, we, we see a fair amount of, uh, of research coming to us. And, and ultimately, if we measure... Um, the, the interest of the, uh, the agencies in having parabolic flight um, in, in, on both sides of, of the border, north and south in North America, um, funding for the, uh, f for the facilities remains, or for the research remains strong. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, I see also that you have on your video that you provided us some student working, so that's also one important oh, yeah, aspect. Yes, on absolutely, it. thank you very much, yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we also, yeah, indeed, uh, as part of uh, CSA's uh, outreach program and uh, investment in uh, HQP, uh, we have an annual competition where students come and uh, have the opportunity to experience uh, microgravity themselves, which is, uh, is, is as much as, uh, equally as important as the yeah, experiment we'll, as the person. We'll experience. come to that in the next question, the student. Uh, involvement in public flight. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Duff. I would like also to add maybe a quick word for the Asian side. I know that in Japan, they run also parabolic flight, but on a small aircraft, basically, to prepare experiment to fly on the ISS. And on the uh, Chinese side, you see here at the uh, top of this um, slide here, you see my colleague, Dr. Yang Yang, who I guess is present here. Uh, with whom I worked also uh, a little bit while I was at the CSU. Uh, actually, China does not have a, a plan to have its own uh, 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 public flight aircraft for the moment, uh, and they prefer to come here to Europe and to use the European uh, plane to uh, prepare their own experiment. They already flew two or three experiments, uh, part of ESA and, and, and CNES campaign, and DLR campaign, sorry. And also, from time to time, uh, Chinese astronauts come to fly on CNES campaign as well. Uh, and there are plans also for them to have maybe in a couple of years their own campaign uh, on a uh, European plane. So that would be then the first uh, question uh, to which we provide some answer. And it's obvious that there is an importance uh, for sure as part of microgravity research in general. Now, second question, what about the users? Uh, and we would like to put the emphasis first on the student. What can students learn from a participation in a public flight campaign? And I would like to turn first to uh, Nigel, Dr. Nigel Savage. Nigel, you're responsible for the uh, ESA student uh, activities. Please tell us your point of view on this. That's right. So um, perhaps to put things into context, we have to look back some 50 years ago uh, when the ESA charter was signed. And what we'll notice is in some of the first paragraphs of this charter, uh, it was stated that ESA shall conduct education activities. And this is why there's an education office uh, still uh, alive today. And the purpose of this office is to basically make sure that there's a steady stream of professionals that can come and maintain the knowledge that, uh, that we have and to maintain uh, young professionals streaming into not only ESA but also to European industry. 
Um, so that's the primary reason for the ESA Education Office. And in this ESA Education Office, we have what's called the ESA Academy. The ESA Academy uh, provides opportunities for university students as well um, as uh, training courses, which I, if anybody wants to talk about uh, all our activities, I'm more happy to do that later. But just to focus on the hands-on activities, Fly Your Thesis is the program which deals, um, which provides student teams with parabolic flight opportunities. Um, it's quite a simple program. Uh, we release a call uh, for opportunity once a year, every spring, and the students have uh, approximately six months or so to submit some documentation for us to uh, basically persuade us and persuade a selection board uh, that their experiment should be the ones to be flown on the aircraft. Uh, the selection board is experts from ESA, experts from Novespas, uh, some scientists from the European Low Gravity Research Association, and we have the students uh, come to ESTEC in Nordwijk in the Netherlands to present their program to us in a very formal setting. So already this is quite educational for them. They're faced uh, <laughs> literally meters away from experts in the field, and they have to really defend their, their program. Um, now, we have limited numbers of spaces on the aircraft, which means that not everybody who comes to the selection workshop gets selected. Uh, the teams, the majority of the teams that don't make it get some educational value out of participating because they get feedback on how to improve their, their proposal for, for next year. And in fact, we have some nice examples where this, this kind of feedback was already given to some teams. They come back the following year with new and improved uh, project proposals and some, uh, some higher TRL levels, etc. And they actually managed to fly. This is the case for one team that's presenting at IAC 2018 today, uh, tomorrow, I believe. So, but for the teams that have been selected, uh, the educational value is not just you have a ticket, you fly. Um, that would be far too easy. So... What the education office does is uh, takes basically their hand throughout the entire phases of the project. And the first phase is basically spending a week uh, in Redu in our training and learning facility in Belgium, in ESEC. And there they get uh, basically workshops on project management, risk management, financial management. Uh, they have one-to-one -one, uh, time with the experts of the facility, so they'll spend between anything between three and six hours with, uh, with Novice Pass right there uh, and us just to try and get their project in the right direction. Um, and we also spend some time with, perhaps maybe the term is not correct, but the softer skills as well. So outreach, every project has uh, an outreach aspect to it, it has a financial aspect to it, it has a team member um, a team member cohesion aspect to it. Uh, for, for many of these students, it's the first time they take such a big project on it, and it is a big project. Um, and so we found that taking them through this one week of a workshop in, in Redu, showing them all the aspects, is really a guiding light uh, for them. Um, once we, that week is over, then we enter the sort of um, design, rethink, redesign, rethink, re-redesign phase, and then eventually, um, you know, they, they'll start cutting some metal and building their experiment. But we have regular uh, telecons with them and also with Elgra and Novespas just to make sure that their design is, uh, is up to scratch and will eventually manage what they want to do, which is the science. Um, so this, this takes the large part of about a year, as I mentioned before. That's quite ideal because it fits in uh, a master's as well as a PhD uh, program uh, schedule. And then, of course, uh, time comes for the parabolic flight campaign. Uh, this is tremendous. A lot of hard work has gone into it. And uh, we spend two weeks in the aircraft, uh, putting it all together, flying, getting the results we want. And, um, and every single student absolutely loves the experience. It's, uh, you know, the, the sensation of floating there for them is something that they'll never forget. And we have some interviews there. If only you could hear them. <laughs> they, uh, they really speak very highly. But, so that's the students. Of course, the students are always going to be very enthusiastic. And I'm, I'm just going to read a quote from uh, a professor because we, we like to have some feedback from the professors as well. And I'll just finish off with that. And I think it'll, be, it'll lead into Jean-Baptiste. Uh, Thing. So this is a quote from Daniela Alazar, uh, uh, supervisor of uh, team from last year, um, from Isaïe Supero. 
I would like to thank ESA Education for such a wonderful program, and I would like to encourage ESA to maintain such a program. I am completely persuaded that it is a very good investment for ESA. The PhD students trained through Fly Your Thesis will be particularly pertinent to manage future European space projects, which is, I think, a nice wrap-up because that's exactly what uh, is in the ESA mandate uh, when it talks about uh, ESA education. And I think it's also applicable to Jean-Baptiste because uh, he started off as a student. <laughs> yeah, Jean-Baptiste, tell us then. Before yes, being a scientist, you were a student like all of us, but you had already a chance to come on board then. Please. Yes, a long time ago, it was on board the Caravel Zero G, and I was in PhD at this time, and the selection was not so complex as now, because we just sent an ID to CNES, and CNES said, okay, you can have one flight on board the Caravel, and we had three flights with two different experiments, but it was the first time we must produce an experiment to have some nice results, make some new ID, and then I've got my PhD, of course, and then one year later, when I was in postdoc, we had an idea concerning the dust. I will speak later about uh, what I'm doing in microgravity. But we proposed an experiment to CNES. I was not really a student, not really a scientist, because I have not a permanent position at, uh, at that time. And because I have participated to student campaign, CNES said to us, OK, you have a new idea. It's a scientific idea. It's a good idea. You can participate to the flight. So I think that student campaigns are very important because first, uh, we learn how to build an experiment in time with a restricted amount of money. It's very important. And also, when we discover microgravity, of course, we want to come back. <laughs> That's clear. And then we can have some idea to make some new experiment, how to conduct the project. And if now, if I'm working on microgravity, more or less, but I'm, uh, I am always involved with microgravity, it was because CNES has and then ISA has given me the, the chance to participate to such an experiment. And now, when I have some student, for thesis or even short-time uh, student, I try to involve them in microgravity. And they are very happy to participate and probably have um, produce some new generation of new scientists because they have participated to such an uh, amazing experiment. Thank you, Jean-Baptiste. So this is also very interesting, of course, to see how we take care of the students, which are actually tomorrow scientists. Uh, and it's, better, or it's good, of course, to involve them as soon as possible into uh, space research. So the next category of users, of course, next to the uh, students, are the scientists. So our next question, the third question, would be what makes Parabolic Flight attractive as a test platform for scientific research and testing? So not only the scientists, but the engineers also. And I would like to turn first to you, Marcus, if you could, uh, well, tell us your opinion about this in terms of uh, scientific uh, interest for, of the Parabolic Flight. Mm -hmm. well. Before I joined the DLR Space Administration, I was a scientist myself and had a science group and a research group at the university in Bonn and uh, have flown, I think, a couple of hundred parabolas already. And uh, what was really important for me was um, that we could bring our own experiments. That was really important for all of us, for all the scientists that uh, flew along with me to more or less use your own equipment that you know very well. You, you are very familiar with it, you know exactly how to use it, and then you put it onto this plane. This is so important, you can't believe how difficult it is when you have a very specialized equipment to fly on the ISS or wherever, but you never had really time to work with it, to, to understand exactly how it works, what the results were on Earth. And this is completely different here. You know exactly how your, your system works or how your your equipment works, what the results are worth, and then you put the same system more or less into that plane and you fly it in hypergravity, you fly it in partial gravity or in, in microgravity. It's so important. And this is also the reason why we had so many publications from these experiments, because we had a lot of data sets from, from ground-based research, a lot of data sets from maybe centrifugation research, and in addition, as a cream on the cake, we had some experiments and results from microgravity research. This is really embedded then in a good basic research you do or we do uh, in, in the lab. 
And on top of that is also very important, and I, I really like to mention that here is the high quality of microgravity you can achieve with that plane. I'm not exactly sure if it's the same in, in all planes that are flying parabolas, but this is really very important. You can fly a lot of parabolas with some kind of microgravity, but for an, an organism, a system, or a cell, it is very important that it is of very good quality. And on top of that, it's also important to have a good support from a crew that is very familiar with the parabolic flights, that supports you, that know exactly where the problems are, that help the students or the new groups uh, to arrange for an experiment set up. To, they know exactly uh, what uh, you have to, to take care of, what kind of brackets you have to use, what kind of screws, and then it works usually. Uh, this is a very um, valuable effort to do in uh, before you do the experiments. And if you go to the plane with your experiment set up and is well prepared, then that's also the reason why we had this big success rate. It was usually very well prepared. As a biologist, you always have to, uh, okay, you know that it never works as expected or usually it's a little different from what you expected. <laughs> that's normal, that's biology. Uh, but we were always happy with a, a great support and this is really a big uh, help, and it's an, an, a necessity to have this. Um, another point I would like to mention is the students. I never had problems to find uh, very motivated, very dedicated students. In some other groups, uh, my colleagues, uh, other professors were complaining about, I can't find a PhD student or I can't find a master student, and I never had problems because it was always experience of a lifetime, and my students came back to the university and told other students and pupils, well, that was so great. That was an experience of a lifetime, and you shouldn't miss it. And they had a long list of candidates, and they always wanted to fly. But not only to fly. They really enjoyed to be involved in all the preparation, in writing the documents, in preparing the, the setup, the, the experiments. And uh, that was uh, my, I think, uh, most uh, rememberable or the, the most uh, the nicest experience I had in this time that was that we had always a great team of students and uh, I wouldn't miss any of the campaigns we did together that was always a great experience for me as well thank you Marcus uh, <clears throat> thank you for this uh, testimony of the first time of course uh, Derek you had also experience of course at, uh, as a test flight uh, uh, engineers and, and, and flying personnel so please tell us why is it so important also for testing purpose basically so I took a in reflecting on the question, I sort of took a bit of a different, uh, a different approach. I mean, uh, a lot of the applications of parabolic flight are, are, are well known. And uh, certainly over the last number of years at uh, NRC, we've been really focused on uh, fundamental uh, uh, physical research, applied, uh, applied research, and then technology development leading to the ISS. And uh, sort of looking forward now, I sort of see there's two, uh, two avenues where, it's, uh, where parabolic flight will continue to be or will be more important than it has been in the past. Uh, and, and one is uh, uh, human in the loop testing, and then the other is, is Martian and lunar gravity uh, related research. And so human in the loop testing, obviously we, we've spoken about it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not uh, cosmically complicated to, uh, to understand why it's important to get uh, the human uh, exposed to microgravity, and we obviously have the great opportunity at the ISS for prolonged uh, scientific research. But as we look at the, um, the expansion of uh, commercial space opportunities, there's a whole new niche of research that's gonna need to be evaluated uh, as we have, you know, going from 500 humans that have gone into space, that'll increase by orders of magnitude over the coming decades. And so there's a, a, a great body of, of investigation that has yet to come where um, parabolic flight will fit nicely into uh, to answering those questions about motion sickness and, and are there biometric indicators of that uh, as you have all these new flyers coming in. Um, and, and, the, and those sorts of research, or, or to evaluate or to, to design the, the, the next generation of space seat where you have a commercial uh, uh, passenger or crew member needing to be properly arrested for the uh, ascent and descent. And so these are uh, new opportunities I see coming, and I think those are uh, one, one of the niches that will be uh, very applicable. Uh, and then moving uh, towards the, uh, the Martian and lunar gravity, and this, uh, the, image, uh, the video on the screen here is a shot from a campaign this past summer where we did... Uh, um, wheel-soil interaction uh, research with Concordia University. And essentially, um, uh, cl clearly, as we, as we look at uh, all the roadmaps leading us uh, to the moon, to Mars, there's an enormous body of research that's going to need to be conducted. 
And, uh, and, and again, parabolic aircraft really present, I think, sort of fundamentally the, the sole capability to, to build into that, in, into those steps, uh, to prepare for, for, for mining, for additive manufacturing, uh, to understand the basic physics of regolith impact. And in fact, in that context, um, we're just embarking on, a, on an effort with uh, Southwest Research uh, Institute to, de uh, to redevelop a, a vacuum chamber for uh, use in microgravity. So going back to uh, Apollo days when uh, NASA created, a, it was a six foot chamber uh, for a carriage in the back of their uh, 135 perhaps at that time, might have been before that. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that research is coming back to the fore again. And so it's, yeah. it's that emerging capability development that I see a, a continued great interest in uh, parabolic flight. Okay. Thank you, Derek. And uh, your last subject, talking about regulate and testing, that gives me the occasion now to turn to, to you, Jean-Baptiste. You took also the opportunity to work on that since nearly uh, 25 years, or past 25 years, basically, on, um, there we go, on this experiment, PROGRA2, uh, which involves measuring a property, optical property of dust and regulate. So tell us about it. Yes, first I want to say that when you are in microgravity, when there is no weight, it's a new physics. It's clear. Parabolic flight are not only dedicated to a space, no, a space you know, astronaut, and so No, we can, it's a laboratory to study a new physics. That's really important. And when we start uh, our project uh, 25 years ago, we had a very small question. Can we compare the light scattered by comet, where dust are in uh, suspension, in levitation, and dust on the surface of the moon or, uh, or an asteroid? And we make one, two, three, to campaign to test this. If the answer was yes, okay, we stopped. But the answer was no. The light scattered by dust in levitation is totally different of the light scattered by dust on a layer. And so we said, okay, we want to make some new campaign to test new samples, and we test a large number of samples. And we found that, in fact, there is no rules. I mean, the, uh, the way the dust scatter light is dependent only on the nature of the dust. There is no universal law. So we need to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate a large number of scattering phase functions to better identify all the dust that we can find in Earth's atmosphere, in planetary atmosphere, in space, and sometimes also. And regulate it is why it is important to have some measurements during Martian or uh, lunar uh, gravity because we can have the dust not not in layers, but not really in levitation, it's just in between, and it's also very important. So when we start our project uh, a long time ago, okay, we said we will continue just a few years, and we continue again now. <laughs> so I was a very young scientist, scientist at uh, this date, I have some hair, longer than now. <laughs> now now I'm a here. senior scientist, and we can see a picture of me uh, was on the, on the upper, upper right, yes. And now I'm a senior scientist. And uh, something very important, we found some, not some law, but some uh, properties for irregular grains. And we found a very uh, societal application of our research. We start just to understand how the light is scatter scattered by comets. And now we have produced a very small instrument to study the dust in the Earth's atmosphere, in particular for pollution measurements. And now it's a commercial instrument sold by French company. So we start some fundamental research 25 years ago, and now we have some societal applications. So I think it is one of the success of the parabolic flights. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I would like also to complement just one thing that, that you said, if the next slide would like to come up. Uh, it's regarding the fact that we can measure not only at zero G, but also at moon and Mars gravity. And um, well, doesn't work. Technique, please. Uh, what I wanted to show is basically some boiling phenomena. You know, boiling is a physical phenomena which is known for centuries, if not millennia, to humanity. But the physics and chemistry, physical chemistry of boiling, is something very complicated. And there we go. There we go. And you see here on the panel. Uh, boiling on one spot. This is from the, uh, experiment, the uh, experiment of uh, the Technische University of Darmstadt. You see here in 1G during the flight, 
uh, in mass G, 0 0.38, 0 0.16, so the moon G, and then at 0 G. You see that the bubble differ quite differently. And you say physics was it's a little bit different, absolutely. Of course, parameters are always the same, simply that you put G equals zero in the model equation, and you see that the effect is completely direct. So it's very interesting, of course, platform, very versatile, versatile platform as well, that can provide not only zero G, but parcel G and also hyper G, high G then. Okay, very well, thank you. So we come now to the last question that we need to debate, which is the fourth question. And we go, I can skip this one, thank you. What are the perspectives of public flights in a changing space market, and what are the chances for private enterprise? And I would like to turn first to uh, my friend Hans Selig, who is now uh, launching a new approach with a new type of aircraft. So, Hans, please tell us about it. Yeah, okay. Does it work? Does it work? Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Vladimir. At first, I would like to distinguish between uh, two sectors, uh, the sector of uh, customers and the provider sector, and I would like to start with some words about the customer side. Uh, beside the traditional space industry, there is a growing number of uh, small and mid-sized um, companies that are active in the, uh, the so-called uh, new space market, and there is a uh, remarkable development in the past, and maybe I hope uh, also in the future. And um, not only the big players like, like SpaceX or other big companies discovered the uh, big potential of this um, new era, but also um, small and mid sized enterprises um, do a lot of develop development and research uh, in, in the area of. Um, microgravity um, relevant uh, technology and of course um, a huge huge number of startups for example formed in the past years and everybody expects uh, uh, even a further uh, acceleration in this development in the future um, of course not any um, technology or, or, or not any activity in this field is uh, related to micro microgravity technology development, for example, um, the development of technology for uh, communication satellites does not depend on the possibility to test uh, equipment or subsystems in micro G conditions or partial G conditions. But there are also a lot of uh, very interesting research topics that um, where, where micro or zero G or partial G plays a major role, for example, to, to name only a few, uh, 3D printing in space, which could be a very interesting uh, topic in the future. Or, for example, the technology development for habitats for Moon and Mars. Or um, there are, are a lot of possible um, things. Maybe the, the, on the longer uh, time scale, um, te technology for space mining, asteroid mining, uh, which would have to be tested in zero or partial G conditions. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there are um, yeah, a lot of interesting things that need uh, uh, tests in zero G or partial G uh, conditions. And I, um, or I expect, um, uh, or due to this increase of um, activities, especially in the private uh, sector, I expect or we expect also a, a, an increase in the demand for uh, micro G or partial G facilities and at this point I would like to come back to the first sentence when I said that there are two sectors and now I would like to say about our or uh, the provider sector and uh, this um, this impression of the increasing demand uh, was one of the reasons for us to start the development of a new um, facility with a small aircraft, a Cessna 206, with six-seated uh, six um, small aircraft, single-engine piston. And um, we, with this, this is a, um, a small company here in Bremen, Gerhards GmbH, with a 40 years experience in aerospace uh, development. Um, we started the or we are still in the development phase of this project in the frame of a, U a EU funded uh, project and our goal is to offer 
around 150 seconds per hour, um, zero G or partial G, at a price of one single uh, drop tower flight. Uh, to give you a, just just an idea of the, the cost, so it's a very low price per second, <laughs> zero G, and um, we 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 think that it's um, interesting to have a new uh, new um, offer with a maybe um, a, a, the missing link with a little bit more flex flexibility in terms of scheduling and campaign planning and so on. Because uh, the big planes, of course, um, are, uh, the, the schedules are different. So, so you have to, to, uh, to calculate a, a much longer lead time. And we, we want to um, serve especially the new demand from, from the new space side, the new space uh, market, but also, of course, the traditional um, customers from universities or we are also very interested in some kind of cooperation in the education area. Maybe there is uh, some opportunity to do student experiments in, in such smaller aircrafts. And there is, a stu there is already uh, from the Netherlands uh, uh, a, a citation aircraft mm -hmm. where, where they offer 15 seconds of microgravity and they have some years of experience. And um, so we are not alone, and I hope that there will be uh, a fru fruitful cooperation because it's, it's also important for me to, uh, to underline that it's not intended to be some kind of competition to already existing. No, it's facilities. typically complementary to other platforms. Yeah, from, yeah. from our point of view, um, our approach is a nice way to enrich the, yeah. the facility range. And to could, you, could you tell us what's the duration of microgravity that you would achieve with the plane that you, that you provide? That you yes, we, are, we have already performed several test flights, of course, and um, the, the typical duration for zero G is between seven and eight seconds. Okay. So yeah. it's m more comparable to the drop tower in catapult yes. mode. Yes than to the Falcon 20 or the Airbus. But in terms of cost, it's still relatively low, uh, low cost then. Yes. Yeah. Okay, very good. Yes, but we, also, uh, we can also offer a partial G, of course, with yeah. a longer time. And yeah. we, we would lo like also like to offer um, hyper G with 2G, up to 2G with an extremely low gravity yeah. gradient because yeah. of this large radius. It's much mm -hmm. better than any centrifuge. Okay, so thank you. So this, this approach of providing... Maybe, maybe one last yeah. uh, thing. Very uh, if, quickly. If someone is interested in this uh, project Migrop, which means microgravity operations, we have a booth uh, at, our, yeah. at the exhibition F35, just for those who are interested. No advertisement then, thank you. <laughs> okay, but just to, to, to stay in the same approach, I would like also to report on a new approach that we launched recently. That was first done two years ago at the ISU in, in Haifa, in Israel. It's the gl uh, Glide, a public flight for student experiment. And with my colleague and friend uh, Norbert Frischhaus, who is here somewhere in the audience, uh, we, we, we flew already two weeks ago here in Belgium, well, in Belgium, not too far from here, basically, in Saint-Hubert with uh, uh, teachers, actually lecturers from the University of Louvain, and we, we could perform some uh, simple experiment. This is a little video that was taken. I was one of the subject or one of the flying uh, passengers there. Now, don't believe because it's glider that this is easy flying. Huh? We just dive first. And then you will see the first uh, resource that we take is at 4G. And then suddenly the little bolt that you see there getting very heavy to put back in place. So, but it was quite interesting. We did uh, up to 11, 12, 13 parabola or so during flight that lasted between 10 and 15 minutes at most, starting from altitude at 800 meters. So four, five seconds, six seconds of zero G, mainly to be used for pedagogical experiment. And we would like then to propose this uh, to the public flight community to perform that at university. Main advantage, of course, is cheap. It's uh, uh, geographically very close to uh, most of the university, of course. And it's also something that uh, students can participate in, because during that series of flights, we had one student flying also 
uh, on board, and she enjoyed it quite a lot, actually. The second avenue that I would like to report is the discovery flight for the general public. Of course, Novice Pass and Air Zero G offer this possibility already since 2013, so five years now, where the idea is actually to have space tourists, put it like that, but um, a member of the public who, who uh, would be willing to pay a certain amount of money to participate into this flight and discover uh, moon gravity, Mars gravity first, moon gravity, and then zero-g. This is typically a moon gravity. You see people are all smiling. This beginning of the flight, of course, face get a bit longer at the end of the flight, but still it's very interesting to see how people react. And then the last thing that I would like to report is regarding astronaut training. So this is a group of... Uh, uh, the young ESA astronauts, when they were selected in 2009-2010, we had a series of uh, flights for them, parabolic flights for them to train, and they discovered that, and they quite enjoyed That was their first approach to zero-g. They trained to uh, some uh, system for the space station, and also how to behave and how to move in zero gravity. And further on, of course, parabolic flights were used in general for testing other systems and to train also astronauts on the NASA side, on ESA side, on the Russian side as well. And with this uh, new company that I was telling you about, Blue Abyss, we would like now to go the next step forward, which is what we call the parabolic flight 2.0, where we would offer training in parabolic flight, but in a more integrated environment during the zero-g or during the moon, g and the Mars-g. So you see that there are new avenues as well to be explored with parabolic flight, and parabolic flight are not, well, they were never boring, but it's not simply do the parabola, you can find new application for this parabolic flight. So I think we came now to the end of these uh, questions, so I would like to thank you for your answer. I would like to turn now to our audience and ask them if they have any question to address to our panelists here. So we have uh, five experts in different fields, so please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to arrive. No question, very good. Okay, yes? Ah, somebody courageous enough. Yes, hello. Hello, I, I'm Tom Smith, I work at King's College London, uh, but I'm from Australia and my colleagues here are interested in developing a parabolic flight capacity uh, okay. in some way uh, in association with the new space agency in Australia. Uh, of course, it's early days. Um, but my question to the panel is, uh, what's your advice for a country developing the sort of capacity uh, that you've been talking about? Ah, very wide and broad question. Well, to whom shall we turn? Uh, Duff, what about jumping into this one? So, so is it what, what sort of advice would we offer? Are we talking technical advice or flying or uh, management? So how do you start a parabolic flight uh, cap capability uh, that you don't already have? So I would say you would want to start looking at the, the types of applications, the research that you'd want to, uh, you'd want to achieve and, and the nature of the demand um, because you want to understand sort of what the, 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 the physical windows that you want to achieve, the, the duration of the G, the, the, the volumetric size, uh, the quality of the G. And that would uh, drive you, you know, potentially to consider what kinds of platforms. And then when you talk what kinds of platforms, then you need to look at what kinds of modifications are necessary in order to achieve, uh, uh, achieve repeated parabolas. And it was actually one of my, I was going to ask hands afterwards, but one of my uh, interesting questions about, or one of the questions I had about uh, uh, the evolution of the, of the 206 is what types of modifications did you need to, to embody into the aircraft uh, in, in our Falcon? We have uh, engine oil accumulators, fuel accumulators, hydraulic accumulators, all those sorts of things. Uh, and I was just curious if in a, in a piston engine, uh, if it, it's the same, uh, the same sort of deal. Yeah. So that, that's one very uh, critical part in, in the development phase, of course. But all this all also depends on the duration of the zero G. So if you have less than 10 seconds, for example, it's not, not a big problem, but for example, we have uh, we had two different types of C C two uh, C two O six, and one with a turbo lada engine and one with a ordinary piston engine. And the turbo lada can have some problems with the oil uh, supply, mm. and that that would need some modification. But the, ordi no, the this ordinary piston engine not. 
And at the moment, we are in, in mm -hmm. discussions with the authorities uh, how to deal with this, both types of engines. Okay. So basically, so, to have, sorry, if I may just ask one quick word. Basically, to have a parabolic flight capability, you need obviously a plane. You need some technical crew, the pilot, the people in the cabin, the engineers to prepare the plane and so on. You need management, you need money to run the show, and you need users eventually. So you need either students or scientists or, or engineers who want to do something. So I suppose you have already the plane, um, you have, or at least identified the plane, and then you need to find the rest of the personnel and some funding to run the show as well. Well, we wish you good luck anyway, and uh, it's a very good uh, news as well to hear that there might be a capability in Australia very soon. Do we have another question? My friend Norbert. Yeah, I, thank you very much, Vladimir. I do have a question regarding um, to Hyper-G. You have seen the video with Vladimir, so when you dive down with the glider plane, we just easily hit like four Gs for a split second. But in fact, my plane can do plus, plus nine, minus seven Gs. And I'm just wondering in terms of hypergravity, what kind of experiments could you envisage? Like I go in a steep bank and then I will pull the stick and get to two Gs, three Gs. What would be a typical flight profile in terms of hyper-G that you would foresee? I would turn to Marcus because he's our expert scientist on board with Jean-Baptiste, uh, uh, Jean of course, but uh, Marcus. Well, there's certainly demand for hypergravity experiments, uh, but of course there, had, there have been done a lot of experiments in centrifuges, uh, but it was said already, usually the problem is that we use short arm human centrifuges mm -hmm. with a gradient of, of acceleration, which is not always uh, the big problem, but it sometimes causes several problems for, for different parts of the body. So the, the larger the radius is, the better is, of course, the, or the sta more stable the, the, the 9G or whatever you have minus 7G is. However, this is really a big number. So usually what kind of launch um, uh, accelerations you have is in the range of 2 or 3G, not much more than that. In the shuttle, I guess we had between it's 2 and 3G three three. with the new, more modern uh, rockets. It's in the same range. So I think nobody would, would like to see an astronaut sitting in a 4 or 5G launch vehicle. Uh, so basically, this is the level that we study uh, in terms of human physiology. Um, so this is probably good enough for that. But I have also to mention that it's uh, not only about humans, it's also about cells, for example, tolerances and so on. And then you probably would choose uh, an, an cell system, um, maybe attached to a plex um, plexiglass slide or whatever, and then you can do, of course, a lot of good experiments testing uh, immune cells, for example, how tolerant they are against uh, gravity, against acceleration at all. It is not always about uh, finding exactly what's happening at 1G or minus 1G or 0G. It's also detecting mechanisms. And these mechanisms uh, are sometimes hidden behind the gravity effect. Mm -hmm. So we are usually not looking into the effect of microgravity when we go into space or go into microgravity, but we want to understand what is gravity doing normally to our tissues, our cells. And for that, it can be very helpful, of course, to study and to find these effects in these cells and what it's doing to genes, to protein level, to cell level and the tissue level, for example. Nigel, do you want to add something also? You have a program also for uh, spin your thesis yes. for centrifuge, so how could it be combined right. with so zero-g experiments? We have, we have two programs that make use of uh, hypergravity platforms. Uh, we make use of the NVHAB facility, which uh, we just spoke about for human physiology, but uh, we also have a large diameter centrifuge in, uh, in Aztec in the Netherlands. And there, the typical kind of experiments, just a couple of weeks ago, we just had a campaign, so we had some small um, zebrafish uh, being spun down and the team was looking at the development of the bone in these uh, zebrafish larvae and okay they needed something along like 48 hours uh, centrifugation so that was that was a long-term thing which wouldn't be possible in an aircraft of course but we also had um, another team which was looking at avalanches so um, granular avalanches and this is something that literally needs five seconds in order for it to happen and uh, uh, they were looking at various gradients as well, and I, I could see that this could be translated quite nicely to, uh, to a parabolic, well, sort of uh, hypergravity 
um, platform on, on an aircraft. So it's, uh, and as was stated, you know, scientists don't want to just look at one G point, they want to look at the whole spectrum, and that's what really gives you the, uh, the answers of what you're looking for. Okay, thank you. Maybe we have time for a very last short question. If not, I think we are, yes? No? Okay, please. Um, Conrad Glaszewski, TV Dortmund, one short, short question about this parabolic flight. Do we have any uh, size or weight limitation in power uh, output limitations for scientific equipment which we put in there? Well, a very short answer. In zero-g, of course, there's no weight. So there's no zero weight, so there's no weight limitation, really. But maybe yeah. we should talk about mass. Um, yeah. yeah. Mass, uh, there are some limitations, of course, but this is not so much related to the zero-g environment, but more on the loading of the, of the floor, of the floor structure, yeah, basically. Yeah, I mean technically. Yeah, and that would depend from one plane to another. Uh, maybe, Hans, you can say something for your plane, the, the, the project that you want to push. If there is any mass or weight limitation that you can take on board? Yes, of course. Um, there is a limitation. Uh, at first, you have, of course, to, to follow the weight and balance uh, limits. And um, the, the, for our um, example, we have a maximum payload of around 150 kilograms when we want to have one or two persons as experimenters on board. And on the floor, we have a, a limit for, for, the, uh, square, uh, for the surface load. I think it's 1,000 pounds per square feet or something mm -hmm. like that. And it's all in, in, the, in the documents. Yeah. And then, of course, Duff. that would, will, would be provided for yeah. the customer. Duff, do you want to add something there? Yeah. Um, in comparison on the Falcon, uh, sort of 3,000 pounds is getting to our upward mass limit for... Uh, 3,000 pounds, that's yeah, about... Uh, 1,500 kilos. Uh, 1. 1.5 yeah. tons, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and just as a side note, um, f floor loading, all, all of what you said, uh, absolutely true, but also then there's... Uh, when you look at installing uh, experiments into the aircraft, you have to consider crash loads and yes, these kinds of design obviously. factors, and that's what... Uh, from our, my experience is what uh, limits mass frequently. Yeah. And then the aperture of the door. That's perhaps one of the Falcon's shortcomings is it's a small door, so okay. we, we either need experiments to be small or in pieces. Or at least that you can put in several pieces and then reassemble yeah. exactly. inside the cabin. Yeah. yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. I think we will conclude here. I would like first to thank you, but then also thanks all panelists and ask them for a quick word of conclusion. And I would like to start with you, Marcus. How do you see the future of public flight in a very, very short sentence? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Vladimir. Well, you heard what I said, and uh, I'm really a very big fan of, of parabolic flights, uh, but of course, for very professional reasons, of course. Uh, Parabolic flights offer us a very diversity of, of possibilities to study uh, not only all the standalone experiments you can do, but also prepare for the future, prepare for exploration, prepare also uh, ourselves for uh, uh, the human in the universe. So that is really what I expect in the future from parabolic flights, that we are better prepared, very well prepared when we go out there and uh, live in the universe. Okay, thank you. Uh, Duff? Really, just in a short word, uh, I think the future is very bright for, for parabolic flight and microgravity research across the board. Uh, the, the requirements are, are increasing, and, uh, and uh, the pace of uh, experiments that we're seeing are accelerating, so it's uh, just very bright. Okay. Nigel, let's start from the other side then. Well, I, I think um, the parabolic flight programs for students has been a workhorse for the uh, education office, and uh, I, I can only see it develop even more, and uh, in the next few years, I think we can look forward to some more campaigns with students sharing the plane with professionals and uh, really gaining a lot from these, from these sorts of programs. So, yeah, the future is bright. Thank you. Uh, Jean-Baptiste. Yes, I, uh, as a um, scientist, we want to continue to participate in parabolic flight. Once again, scientists with their own experiment on board. Uh, the, que the question is, can we continue to have funding or to have plane operating by National Space Agency or perhaps with a private company? I have not the answer, 
But I think we, we need to think about that and to see what can be offered in the future, both by the national agency and by the future private company. Okay, and Hans, we finish with you from a private point of view. I think uh, I also expect a bright future uh, for, my, uh, for um, parabolic flight, as long as the demand is suffi sufficient, of course. And one part of the demand will be the new space market in the future, I think. Okay, so thank you very much. So this will conclude our roundtable today. Again, thank you very much to all of you for uh, being here and participate uh, into this roundtable. Thank you to our panelists. I hope that we can set up again such a discussion maybe in a couple of years to see how far we are in this bright future, if it's really that bright. And I would like to have a wish as well that not only we will continue and expand public flight here on Earth, but as I mentioned at the very beginning, you see also the duration is function of the gravity field of the planet in which we are. And I hope that one day we could do public flight also, not on the moon, there's no atmosphere, but maybe on Mars. So I gave you all rendezvous in well, 10, 20 years to do public flying on Mars. Thank you again very much to all of you, and I wish you a very nice week here at this IF Congress. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you.